Hi everyone, uh, this presentation is called Bagger and Up. My name is Kyle Boone, um, and we'll just jump right in. Uh, so I'm a team lead at Bloom Health, which is just down the street. It's actually across the street from the poorhouse where everyone went for a happy hour last night. So um, these are various ways to contact me, email, uh, Twitter, my website, which has a blog on it, uh, and a picture of me in kilt, because it's awesome. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I think the photographer just told me to stare off in the distance like I was pondering deep things. Mostly Vagrant at the time? Uh, you know, I don't think I knew what Vagrant was. Actually, that might have been before Vagrant was even created. Or maybe right on, like, right on the cusp. Um, so, what is Vagrant? Vagrant creates um, virtual clouds uh, on your workstation. So, it is essentially just a wrapper around other uh, virtual machine technologies. So um, the free version of Vagrant uses virtual box. Uh, you can add um, plugins for all sorts of other things like EC2 virtual machines or or uh, other VMware type things, uh, you know, more expensive that are faster and, and, and better and things, but um, we just use virtual box all the time and, and it works fine. So uh, essentially it is a uh, an application or a, to let people run um, virtual, create virtual machines in a consistent way across all sorts of different environments and do that from a way that can be checked into source control. So if you have a, a Vagrant file and you want to include that as part of your project, and let's say you have some developers on Macs, like I see most of us have, and, and you have one weirdo on a Windows machine, uh, that one weirdo can actually use the same Vagrant file and install Vagrant and create a um, a virtual box instance uh, through Vagrant that is completely identical to the one that is created on a um, OS X machine or on a Linux machine, and I don't know, maybe BSD, I don't know if there's support on there or not. But, uh, so basically, uh, developers can be, uh, have exactly identical development environments, uh, no matter what it is that they're running on, you know, different versions of OS X, etc. And so we would like to have consistent development environments because all of us at one point have said it works on my machine and then throw your hands up in disgust and just let like your poor QA person or, or operations person try to figure it out on their own. And invariably it's you know probably your fault, but you don't know a minute at the time. And so you said it works for me and, and walk away, right? But so uh, we have been using Vagrant and Bloom for I don't know, I guess almost two years now to try to uh, get people to say this less often and make the development environment be deployed and configured as similarly as possible as we do to our production environment. So many people like have either turned themselves a full stack developer or seen a job posting saying they want full stack developers. Uh, I definitely have said I'm a full stack developer. Typically uh, when us web developers say that we mean that we can do server side code we can write HTML and some JavaScript, and we can write SQL. That's usually what a uh, full stack developer means to us, but this diagram is it's not even complete, but it's a, a better picture of what our full stack looks like, including things like HA proxy, SSL termination, um, you know, having multiple instances of, of, of different applications, so, you know, uh, things like that. Um, we have different databases, you know, sometimes in development mode we might run every database in a single server, things like that, right? Um, uh, so th this picture is much more similar to how we're running in production. Uh, things are clustered appropriately and things like that. Um, and any one of these places could be a potential place where your application uh, goes to die. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I mean, developers are, are well paid and we're well paid to build not just to write software, right? I mean, the text itself doesn't really do anyone any good. We're paying to write software because the software provides business value and makes money for someone. And the way it does that is when it runs someplace other than on your laptop. And so, if you're going to tell me that it works on your laptop, then we're going to put your laptop into production uh, if that's the only place where it works, right? Because it needs to be running, otherwise it's not making money. And if it's not making money, then you're not going to get a paycheck. And as much as I like programming, I mean, I'm a for-profit person and I have a job because I'm not independently wealthy and I want to continue to make money. And so I want to make sure that my software works everywhere it needs to in order to make my company money, uh, which will then hopefully flow down to me. Um, so 
This is not really a talk about DevOps. Uh, DevOps is, I don't know, one of the most overused terms around right now. I mean, there's a lot of them, but this is one of the most sort of overused terms, I think. Uh, I saw a really good tweet. I can't remember by who or the exact wording, but uh, I think it said something like, you know, DevOps, DevOps is the recognition that you cannot have two separate teams create and operate an application uh, in a production software environment, right? So you're recognizing that that really needs to be one single team. And so I think that DevOps is more about the culture of how you go from having a, a development team uh, and say a separate QA team and a separate operations team, which could be a mix of like production support and um, platform operations, you know, people who understand SSL and Nginx and those things that I don't mind you. Um, it's not the recognition that, it's not saying that every single person needs to be an expert in the entire stack because, I mean, I think I'm a reasonably smart guy and I cannot possibly learn all those boxes that were on that, that previous stack, right? So it's not saying that you need to have everyone be an expert in everything so that you can solve any problem, but it is saying that you need to work closely together and potentially sit together and things like that. So I'm not going to get any more into the, the, that into what I think DevOps means. Um, Vagrant is a tool that you could use to help enable sort of a DevOps culture, but it's entirely possible to use a tool like this and still have teams that hate each other and don't want to talk to each other and, and don't work well together and therefore aren't being very effective, right? So this is really about tool, not about uh, culture change in, in an organization. And I'm certainly not saying that we're perfect at doing this either because we have our own culture problems at times that, that every other uh, <coughs> I'm going pretty fast, so I'm going to try to slow down because I don't think I have like 20 slides on the seven already. Uh, so this is a, your very first Vagrant image, right? So you can, uh, once you've installed it, and there are easy directions for doing that on the Vagrant, I think it's vagrantup.com or something like that, but um, there's, there are good directions for doing that online, so I'm not going to go into that. Plus it would take a while to download, and the internet here is not great. Although it is better than other places that have for to talk about this stuff. Uh, but I am going to show what happens after you do that, if I can remember which tab it is. It's pretty readable. <laughs> Alright, so when you type Vagrant in it, it will create a Vagrant file in the current directory. And this Vagrant file is exactly what was created by Vagrant in it. There's been no changes. Uh, so let's just look at it real fast. Uh, doesn't look that great. This is the last right, but it's mostly comments. It's almost entirely comments explaining different options you can use to build your virtual machines, and we'll go over a bunch of those options as we go. Uh, I think there's one important line at the very end, and I'll show it on the next slide. But um, in order to start the machine, you just type Vagrant up. I've already done this once because the first time you do it, it will download not as much as Maven does from the internet, but a lot. Um, and so. I actually did it in this room earlier, but it took three or four minutes, and I didn't want to show the whole thing. Oh, actually, it's already running, so I will halt it and then do, and then start it just so you can see how long it takes. It usually takes some 15 or 20 seconds. So it's actually going to um, stop the machine and then start it back up. Uh, it's do a bunch of SSH stuff and port forwarding and the, all the magic it takes to sort of be over a consistent environment. And there we go. We're done, right? So. Uh, at this point, we can SSH into this box. Now we're in, and you believe me because we have a different prompt, right? Uh, it's, it just starts in a home directory for a Vagrant user. This is a Precise32 is the name of this machine. Uh, I think it's an Ubuntu uh, version of Linux. I don't remember exactly. but. Um, so basically, it's just a, a, a scratch Linux installation. Uh, there's very little on this machine. I don't think Vim is on here. It is not, right? But I could I could app get install if I wanted to. So at this point, I just have a virtual machine. I can do whatever I want. Alright. So that is your very first negative image. You can have it running before lunch, even with this loader in here. So out of everything that was actually in that file that I did less on before, this is all you actually need in order to start that virtual machine. Uh, all through the saying that the vendor, by the way, is written in Ruby, and so the configuration is all done in a Ruby file. So if you're a little familiar with Ruby, that makes it a little bit easier to deal with, but 
it's pretty simple uh, otherwise, so you don't really know a lot of Ruby to, to be able to do this. So all this is doing is saying that it's going to use the Vagrant 2 API and that the box name is HashiCorp slash Precise32, and that will tell Vagrant where to go to download the actual box from it. People can ask questions at any time, by the way. But we'll get into some of, some of what these terms mean as, as we go. Um, this is a, just a list, this is sort of a brain dump of Vagrant commands. Uh, mostly what you will use are Vagrant up, um, Vagrant halt. I, I'm going to write a plugin sometime that renames halt to down, because down is the opposite of up. I, I don't know how many times I've written Vagrant down. Uh, but, Vagrant halt was a little stop machine, that's what I, I ran on the, the previous uh, time. I thought Vagrant stop all the time. Yeah, it doesn't work either, yeah. yeah. You can write plugins, so you could rename it. Um, destroy will actually delete everything. Uh, so that's like I give up and I just want to rerun everything from scratch and download the internet again. Um, you will do that sometimes, you know, hopefully not a whole lot, um, but uh, that takes a little bit longer, so I'm not going to show that one. And yet, uh, I don't really ever use it either because all it does is create that base uh, vagrant file, and typically I just go find an example of something that's similar to what I want to do anyway and start from there. Um, so I don't, I don't use that a whole lot. Um, you can manage plugins, and you can um, you can rerun provisioning as well uh, on a machine that's already running. And we'll get into what the provisioning step is a little bit later. Um, reload is a pretty common one because Vagrant uh, has some issues where, like, if I shut my laptop, there's a decent chance that uh, I will lose certain bits of internet connectivity. Uh, and so sometimes when I if I shut my laptop and the machine is running, I'll need to do a reload. Um, but sometimes you don't, so it's sort of hard to, to say. But I do, I th tend to, when I get into work in the morning, I'll do a vagrant reload and just sort of make sure everything's happy. It's about as fast as doing halt and then up anyway, so it doesn't really, the search is really, I don't know if it does both or what, but it's pretty fast. Uh, and then if you want, you can do like suspend and resume. And so what that'll do is actually, um, whatever is happening at that exact second on the machine, like let's say it was literally in the middle of serving a web request, it will stop. And then, when you resume, hours later, it will just resume doing whatever it was doing at that exact time. Um, so reload is more like you're going to shut some things down and turn things back on, and suspend is more like it's going to save the contents of its of its memory uh, to disk, and then when you turn it back on, it's going to put those back in and start every process, every thread exactly where it was before. So uh, that can be sort of handy, uh, you know, if you're like debugging something and you're like, I'm, I want my database and everything exactly the way it is, and I'll come back later. So, uh, a little bit about different sort of vagrant terms. So, boxes are the base image that you use to start a virtual machine, and uh, that's what the Precise32 was. That, okay. That was that's something I picked up from Rob earlier. But if you go to this site, which I got here earlier, so it would be loaded. But um, there are tons of pre made boxes, um, and you can add them to Vagrant at any time. So um, there's all sorts of different versions of Ubuntu. You can have 32 bit machines, 64 bit machines. There's uh, boxes to use EC2. There's boxes for all, all sorts of different things. So um, we typically just use the precise. Uh, 64, I think. I can't remember exactly, but um, we use one that's uh, as similar as possible to the Amazon uh, image that we use when we go to production. Um, so there's tons of things like that on a maker website. Um, it's not something that you're going to have to think about a whole lot. Generally, you know, sort of once you pick the, the box you're going to use, you know, that's it from, from there on out. Providers is, a, is an important concept. So a provider is the virtual machine that you're going to run on top of. So you have a Precise32 box that, that you then run on a virtual box provider. You can run it on a VMware, a hypervisor, or various cloud providers. So um, each of these different providers is, are gonna have sort of provider-specific configuration options because they all have sort of you know, different feature sets that you can um, so the, the base provider is just going to be uh, VirtualBox, and you know it's it's fine for me. Um, but 
but a lot, I know, also know a lot of people who, if they want to say build a bunch of boxes at one time, and you know, th these can be sort of resource heavy, so you're probably not going to be running like 10 different virtual machines at one time uh, on your laptop unless they're just using you know 100 megs of memory or something. Um, so a lot of people, will, if they want to deploy a bunch of different boxes at once, will do that in a cloud environment. So it's pretty useful to be able to switch providers on and off. And you can even in the same vagrant file um, sort of provide, ha have used both providers. So um, if someone is, like if you are the only person on your team that paid for a more expensive VMware instance, then you could configure that, but otherwise everything else could, would be exactly the, the same. So you just swap out the provider. And this is how you configure providers. So um, this is an example of just using uh, VirtualBox, but there's, um, there's actually one from the last thing I'm going to do is a demo of how we use um, Vagrant at Bloom. Uh, but this is a bit out of how we configure it for our, for our platform. Um, so here, we actually can configure how much RAM it's going to be using and how many CPUs we want to virtually give it. Uh, this is actually really important because that is going to be pre-allocated. So we're actually giving it six gigs of, of, of RAM. Um, if you want to do less, the way we have it set up, you can set the environment variable and use that instead. Um, but because by default we run our entire stack on that virtual machine, um, it's, it's very resource heavy. There's like 25 applications going on there or something. So um, it's quite a, it, it uses quite a bit of, of RAM. Um, and then there, each different provider is going to have a whole suite of, of ways that you can configure it. So um, the way that you modify the VM and that memory in VirtualBox is going to be different than the way you would do it for, say, like an EC2 provider or a uh, VMware provider. Uh, Vanguard has the ability to sync folders between the host machine and the guest machine, so the guest being the virtual machine and the host being my laptop. And so, actually, I'm going to jump back into our terminal and go back into SSH. Uh, and so, by default, it's going to map the directory on the host where your Vagrant file is to slash Vagrant on uh, the virtual machine. So there's a Vagrant directory in there, and if I go in there, uh, I don't even have tab completion because there's nothing installed in this. Oh, and an ls slash. And that's, again, just the Vagrant file. So this is just a map file, a map directory between uh, these two uh, machines, um, the virtual machine and, and the regular machine. Uh, so if you want to, you can um, mount more uh, directories. And so like, if I add this to my Vagrant file, I'm not very good with them, so I don't remember how to jump down to the end of the file, so I'm just going to scroll. I tried to learn like 17 times, and I give up every time. Kate Cousins says he's been a, been a user for three years. That's one because he can't figure out how to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that one. I've got that one down. So what I'm just doing here is I'm mapping uh, one directory up from the directory the Vanguard files in, uh, which is the directory that has this presentation to slash presentation on the um, guest machine. And somehow whenever I do a presentation, I become physically unable to type. So now, oh, I'm going to have to do a reload on this feature. So reprocess that Vagrant file now and uh, in a few seconds, uh, and I go back into the SSH, I should have that new uh, folder uh, map. Alright. Presentation directory there. And there it is, my Google.js presentation. So, um, and we actually mount directories that have a bunch of chef recipes in them and things like that. So uh, this actually can be a pretty, pretty useful uh, feature of Vagrant. So um, 
Yeah, yeah map ID, anything you want. Is Into the, sorry, yeah, okay. is that something that the changes are instantaneous? You have to go and say, like, you can refresh and bring that through, open to, to see it? Yep, yeah, as soon as, uh, yeah, they're, it's using NFS, I believe. Uh, there's a couple different ways. Um, so I may not be using NFS here, but yeah, basically, as soon as any change I make, they will be reflected on both file systems. So, um, one thing that can be in, good to do, I, I think, is that you can map, uh, like let's say that I have source code for a service that I'm working on, uh, I can map that source code and then I can run the build on the Vagrant uh, instance itself if I want, but I can also say load it uh, in IntelliJ uh, and then have the source code be mapped in both places and so you can uh, do fun things like that. Um, Uh, so there's a bunch of, of networking options. Um, you know, there's a whole list of what you can do on the Vagrant site, but uh, if you wanted to uh, forward port 80 on the guest to port 8080 on the host on your laptop because you know somebody else is using 80 or something or whatever, um, then you can do that. We make pretty heavy use of forwarding ports uh, at various times, but uh, so this this can be pretty useful, especially if you have say a large number of things serving HTTP traffic on, on the guest machine and then you want to have them all map to something uh, on, on everyone's ho uh, host machine sort of in a consistent way. So there's lots of networking options. Um, some of them are for speed and things and um, like sharing IP, you can set the IP address and things like that. There's a whole host of, of networking options. Uh, so this is a feature I've never actually used personally. Um, there's a multi-machine option, so if you want to mimic the topology of, of a large system in Vagrant, you absolutely can do that. So you can use Vagrant to spin up multiple boxes at one time. Um, what we're doing is, with ours, instead of having a single uh, machine instance, you know, or VM instance running in the same way we would have it running, say, in Amazon in production, we're just putting everything on one machine. Otherwise, it's pretty identical, but um, <clears throat> for us, the, the Price of having, you know, in terms of how much uh, resources it will be using on your laptop, it just really isn't feasible for us to do that. Um, but you can do it, and like I said earlier, if you were to say use it to control an EC2 instance, then you absolutely, absolutely could use this to um, spin up boxes in Amazon pretty easily um, and have multiple boxes. Uh, one interesting sort of use case I thought of for this is. Uh, we use a technology called um, Gatling for um, doing load testing, and we can actually have, we actually run the Gatling load test, load test from the machine in EC2, and we can actually sort of use Vagrant to automate uh, how we spin those machines up. Uh, we don't put, we, we could do it that way. Um, and then it'd be a little bit easier maybe to do from a developer's machine rather than, right now we have Jenkins uh, kick those things off. Uh, but when you do that also, I mean, you're going to pay for that time to Amazon, and so you have to decide whether or not you actually want 30 people to be able to start spending like a couple hundred dollars an hour to run however many machines it takes to, to do a load test. Uh, but either way, the, um, the syntax for starting uh, different VMs is different, right? So here we're just having uh, a web box and a DB box, uh, and so we can do that or not, but it actually started both those machines. So, so far, it's just sort of automation, right? I mean, there's not, everything we're doing you can do with VirtualBox pretty simply. Um, so maybe kind of what's, what's the big deal? And the part we haven't really touched on so far is provisioning. And provisioning is sort of like the, I don't know, it's kind of the magic, I think, right? I mean, so we use Chef uh, at work to provision our, our um, production machines and our, our QA machines and all, everything else is running in Amazon. And so now we can use Vagrant and we can have Vagrant use the exact same chef scripts to provision itself. And so when, when I do a Vagrant up and I redeploy the latest build in the Vagrant, it's close to humanly possible. We're, not, we're getting there. It's, it's very, very, very close to what we're actually running in production, minus the on one machine. And so the ability for everyone to be able to do that in a consistent, repeatable way is sort of, I think, the big win uh, for Vagrant. So there's lots of different ways to provision machines. Uh, we're using Chef, but there's uh, basic usage. Is, that's, th this list is just from uh, Chef's or from Vagrant's website. I don't really know what basic usage 
basic usage and file and shell all seem very similar to me. Um, we actually we actually use shell provisioning in our virtual machines, and then the shell actually executes Chef, and we do that because that's how we do it in production, and so we just we, we want to get them to be as consistent as possible. But you can just give a list of Chef recipes for um, Vagrant to execute when it does the provisioning step of building up the machine. Uh, you can use Ansible or um, or Salt or Puppet uh, as well, or then you can also use Docker. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Docker at the very end, but Docker is more about using uh, Linux containerization and de um, deploying containers. So if you have, um, if you give Vagrant a container, it will deploy that container to a virtual machine for you. Um, so you can you use that as well. Uh, that's a, I think a, becoming a more popular way to use Vagrant than just using, say, like Chef or something. So this is the world's simplest example of provisioning. Um, if you add this to your Vagrant config file, when it runs the provision uh, step, it will run that inline script against bash, and so it will just echo hello world. Uh, that's really not that useful, but you could in there type app get uh, install vim, app get install git, right, whatever you want. You could just do everything um, through a shell script. Um, that might work for a little while. And so this is actually one that I was using. I was doing some, I was trying to do some development on GVM itself. I don't know if people ever look at the GVM code, but GVM actually has a Vertex um, server that has a REST API that serves up like the different Rails versions that you can download and Groovy versions and basically just has like a name and the URL for a zip file that it downloads and installs. Um, and that Vertex uh, application uses a MongoDB, uh, MongoDB for its database, and I really didn't want to install Vertex and MongoDB on my laptop. You know, I've got a bunch of other stuff for work on there, and I, I really didn't want uh, those two things sort of intermingling, you know, like you could you, you use Homebrew to install MongoDB, but I didn't want to do that. So what I decided to do was just do a very simple Vagrant file for doing uh, GDM development, and this is what I came up with it, so uh, it's pretty simple, right? We're going to install, uh, we're going to use an app get recipe, a chef, this is a chef, right? So an app get recipe, install git, install java, install mongodb, and install vertex. And then after that, um, I think this was this file was in my, the, I had it in the source code directory itself, uh, the top level directory for the source code, and so the source code was mounted uh, in the Vagrant instance, and then I could do you know, Vagrant SSH, and I could go in there and I could run the integration test for uh, GBM without ever having to install any of that software on my laptop. Uh, that could have been even more important if it was using MySQL, but say a way different version than MySQL that uh, I'm running for work, uh, because I don't want to install 5.0 or something for for you know random open source project I'm hacking on the weekend when it, when it can mess up with what I have to do for work when I get there on Monday. Um, I actually I really like this pattern. Uh, I probably should have like suggested putting this into uh, GVM itself, and I didn't. <laughs> um, but I think it'd be really useful if more open source projects started including things like this in the source code repository or in a separate repository, so that if someone wants to um, clone it and start working, they don't have to figure out what all they need to install. Um, and this actually is an example of doing that. And I just sort of stole their idea. Uh, in, before I ever started working at Bloom, I, I did some rail development at IBM. And so this is a Vagrant um, file for doing uh, hacking on Rails core itself. Um, so there's a list, I think it uses Puppet instead of Chef, but it installs Git, RVM, Ruby, and Bundler, and all this stuff that you need to hack on, on Rails. Um, I don't really do that stuff too much anymore, but uh, if you did want to, this would be a really easy way to get into hacking on the REST source code. And I think it would be a great thing for Grails to do as well, because um, I don't, if anyone ever tried to clone and build the Grails source code, I mean, it, like, it takes a while to sort of figure out how to do it. I mean, I tried to just do a simple change to some documentation, and the documentation has to build the source, I think. I mean, there's like some sort of interdependency there, and I never have to work. And so instead, I just made the changes to the pull request without ever writing the build. Uh, and it worked. 
so I, I didn't break it, but um, I was just like, I, I wasn't going to spend like three hours trying to get um, the documentation to build so that I could, it was, I think it was on the 2 3 upgrade documentation that I kind of ran into something that I was like, other people were probably going to run into this and I added it to the upgrade guide. It was like one line kind of thing, but the easier that people in the open source community can make it on sort of normal people like us to contribute back, then the more effective they are going to be at getting lots of, of contributions. And so I, I think it would be a really neat addition, um, which maybe I should just do it myself. But as I said in my last presentation, I'm really lazy, uh, which is why doing things like this is really great for the community, because it lets lazy people like me um, contribute. <coughs> Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that tonight after after happy hour again. Um, so that's really sort of the basics of of Vagrant. Um, I want to talk quickly about a couple of sort of I have two of those related projects. So Docker is uh, Linux containerization, and so it's it's related in the sense that it gives you a way to run an application sort of in a sandbox, but instead of starting an entire virtual machine, it uses Linux containerization to just run a container. So you have a read-only a uh, file system that's basically a clone of the file system it's running on, and it has, it'll run a single process at a time. Um, so it is a way to start um, basically getting some of the advantages of, of a virtual machine, but without having the extremely high overhead of running many virtual machines on your, um, on the machine itself. Uh, if you haven't heard of Docker, it's like sort of taking over the world, I mean, everyone's using it. Uh, in Amazon, you, you can deploy Docker uh, containers using Elastic Beanstalk now. So if you build a, a container as part of your build, it makes it like one click to deploy in Amazon. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, spectacular. Um, definitely recommend it. You know, we're we're not using that at work yet, but it's it's on the short list of things that we're going to start using pretty soon. I think. No. Uh, and the second one is Packer. Packer is I think it's written by the same people who write Docker by HashiCorp. And Packer is a way to um, build, basically like to build boxes. So if you want to build uh, an AMI and say like burn an image of that, um, it's a lot faster than say you're running Chef over and over. And so we actually, in, in our version, what we use for development, we have a base box, we call it, that we build with Packer, and it just has like the stuff that we know we're going to install every single time we run Vagrant or run our, our deployment anywhere, like installing Java and um, you know, whatever else you know, sort of patches we have on, onto the base operating system get built by Packer and then distributed and then you can download that and save yourself quite a bit of steps when you're running Chef. Uh, it's actually shocking how long it takes to download like JDK like from inside of a Vagrant instance. It's like, if it takes me 10 minutes to start up a Vagrant instance, like three minutes of it is downloading Java. So you can save yourself a lot of time by taking as much as possible and putting it into a base image using Packer. Uh, so I didn't have time in this talk to, to get too much into those things, but if you're going to start using Vagrant, um, there are probably things you're going to look at pretty quickly afterwards. Another quick question. Yeah. Um, Docker, does it still say on the website, not ready for production? <laughs> uh, I don't know, um, but people are using it anyway. Right, that's my uh, impression. I mean, I've, I've talked about it at my job, and they go to the website and they're like, oh, it says right off here, don't use it for production. And I'm like, no, yeah. They go to 1.0. Do they go to 1.0 yeah, recently? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Docker went to, I mean, people were using, the, the Docker people said it wasn't ready until 1.0. People have been using it since like 0.6. Or maybe even earlier than that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think Docker just went to 1.0 like a month ago, something like that, maybe six weeks. So it's pretty, uh, pretty recent. Um, but it's, even for being a 1.0 project, it's pretty, I think it's pretty stable. Uh, Vagrant's been around, I want to say, for about three and a half years or so, maybe four years tops. Uh, and Packer for like 18 months. And not Packer, but Docker for like two years, 18 months or two years. So this is a space that's really been rapidly evolving. Um, and it, it can be a bit of a pain because sometimes documentation you find around Vagrant and stuff is for like pre 1.0, and it's pretty different from the pre 1.0 days. So if you're looking for stuff online, I would definitely recommend trying. Make sure you're like I sometimes I actually would just put when I Google I would just put the month I would put like now like December 2013 or something like whatever it is like I don't want I don't want anything before that if I can so I just like put it in my Google search but um, here's some links and then I want to get into a bit more of a demo after this um, 
So the Vagrant documentation is really good. Uh, the up and running guide on there is really simple. I mean, you, you can have the stuff running this afternoon. And the Vagrant source, it's all open source, so it's all hosted on, on GitHub. Um, I have a little bit of a Ruby background, and so I'm able to get in there and, and read the code. Uh, it's not that bad. Um, if you have no Ruby background, then there's probably a bit of a learning curve, but it's, it's not too bad. Because uh, like I said, it's mostly like automation and stuff, so there's not a lot of you're not having to deal with like building virtual machines and stuff, right? It's delegating to virtual bots to do that. And so now I want to show how we use uh, Vagrant <coughs> at BlueMail. Um, so this is an application we call the App Starter. So this is Vagrant.Bloom.com is actually resolving to my laptop. Uh, we just do that so that everyone has this, everyone you can like give people links and it's always going to resolve to your laptop, but uh, just sort of, you know, a hope setting, but um, it's, yeah, it's just my laptop. And so we're running this little Python application on uh, the Vagrant instance itself, and it is talking to every application that we have running on here, and it's telling me the version that's running, if it's up, like if it could be down or it could be degraded. It's actually calling into the health checks and saying, do you have everything you need? Is MySQL running? Is Redis running? Blah, blah, blah. And if one of those is reporting to the down, it, it can come back as degraded. Uh, rather than just like totally down. Um, when I click into here, um, it's actually, so this is all just pretty simple stuff that's, um, most of this is either executing a, a chef recipe, actually on the box, just remote, uh, executing a chef recipe, or uh, this one is actually, um, this, one, this is actually coming from a web service, but all of this data is actually just coming out of the jar that we built, the jar of the ward, kind of what it is, that we built in, um, in Jenkins. So, we put all this stuff into the jar, but then it gives us um, the ability to grab this stuff out, the app version, the JDK we built it with, the build number. I can actually go to that specific build URL and, and look at the changes that were in there. Um, these buttons let us do things like, um, I, can, I can stop or start it, and then the most useful thing is I can actually say, I want to run this uh, locally on my machine. And what that does is that, because this is part of a platform, and so this is our authentication application. So anytime you need to log in, I should just go there actually. Uh, if I just go. So this is actually talking to CAS, Central Authentication Service, is running on Vagrant itself. And then it's saying, no, you're not logged in to anything, so I can't direct you to a, a real application. You need to log in first. And it's redirecting us to uh, our authentication application. Uh, and that happens, I don't think how it does in production. Um, but if I said that I was going to actually say, as I do quite a bit, I want to make changes to that application, um, then I can click this button, run local, and through some port forwarding magic, it'll actually have every other application on the stack that might ever redirect someone to the auth application um, will now redirect to my local host um, through port forwarding. And so then I can, I can run that one locally and I can make changes and I can start, stop, and have debug easily without having to deploy into the into Vagrant itself. Um, and so it's a really powerful feature for someone who is working on one specific piece of our platform, but they want to test it holistically as part of the entire platform stack. Um, if you had to run everything locally and you had to actually understand all the dependencies between the applications to run all that stuff locally, most people would never be able to do an effective, myself included, would never really be able to do an effective job of that. I mean, there's, uh, I don't remember what I said earlier, I think that, but it's like 15 or so applications running, right? So um, it's, a, it's much easier to, to, you know, I run one thing on my laptop and then everything else is running out here. Um, there's a other set of some neat things on here. Um, for things that are drop wizard services, we can actually look at the <coughs> Swagger documentation. Um, Swagger is what we use for building the documentation for our, our REST API. I don't know why this is so slow, but it really it's just for Swagger is really slow. It will eventually go in the right place. But so I can go in here, and these are all the REST endpoints that this um, service provides. And I can go in and I can test them. And so we can actually uh, have our QA people test our REST endpoints without them having to understand how curl works. Um, they can go in here and, you know, they are all technical enough to understand what this stuff is and they know how to go to the database and get, you know, the right data and they can put it in here and so um, they actually do, at the very least, sanity check most of our REST API development and make sure that when we're expecting a 404 that we actually get one we expect 
um, a you know, not authorized or whatever exception we're expecting that the right stuff happens. And um, and then even in some of the services, they can be pretty pretty technical in the sense that you know there's actually a logic flaw in, in, in some of that stuff. So um, yeah, this is makes it really easy. And they, they, uh, the QA can actually also run uh, Vagrant locally and um, and have all the same stuff running. Uh, and I don't know why that one took the but so that's one tab. Right? I can actually, because we have so many things running in here, and like I said, it takes six gigs to run all this stuff. Um, if you want to, like, the off stack is a lot smaller, right? Because there's certain things talk to it. It doesn't talk to this ETL service. It doesn't talk to half of these things. And so I can actually just activate just the ones that I'm going to be using. And then I can, through an environment variable, set um, a smaller amount of memory to a So I can give it two gigs instead of six, um, which is, Pretty useful because if you're using IntelliJ like I do all the time, you know, it also runs two gigs. I mean, I got 16 on here, but it runs out eventually. Um, and I do actually, if I'm running multiple IntelliJ instances, uh, they start to act pretty wonky. I get when I get low. Um, I can go to this other, this is actually a single page app written in, in Angular. Um, but I can go in here and I can deploy uh, the entire stack. I can deploy bits and pieces of it, because the deploy can, can take a little while sometimes if you're going to deploy the whole thing. So I can just deploy the latest stuff that off wants or our consumer application needs. Um, I can go in and deploy specific versions. So um, sometimes if we have a, a problem come in from our production support team uh, around uh, something that's happening in production, I can actually go and get that exact version that's running in production and deploy it into Vagrant and, uh, and then test against that, and then, it, like, let's say it's, we think it's fixed, I can actually sort of prove that out <clears> by <throat> testing it with Vagrant locally and then testing it with the new version locally. Uh, it might take a little while, but it's better than, than what we had before. Um, you can also load data, so there's a couple of different options. So this will actually, we actually grab the latest copy of our production data and then do a bunch of, like, uh, HIPAA sanitization type stuff, so that, or de-identification, um, so that I don't know what insurance someone bought uh, because you know HIPAA violations are like ten thousand dollars a day, and you can like go to jail. You can go to jail. So we use, we can load uh, safe data for us to test with, but that's still realistic enough that we can recreate most production problems in our local set. Uh, we have all these feature flags. Uh, feature flags are uh, put in the Redis, and then the applications can actually say is this feature turned on or off. And so we can come in here and. Um, Turn, turn feature flags on and off at deploy time. Um, and this is really useful for, for QA again because um, a lot of times they'll want to A, test that when it's turned off, the feature's not there, and then they'll want to go and do their regular QA for that story against whatever feature we want to happen in two months in production. Um, then typically when we go to production, we'll remove the feature flag, um, or sometimes we'll leave it in and turn the feature flag on in production, and then we can turn it off if there's a problem. But, um, we're sort of just getting used to using feature flags, uh, really, so this is sort of a newer thing for us, but um, it's way better than having to branch for every single uh, new feature you want to add, and then you have to eventually merge that branch back into to master and like hope that all the merge complex didn't, you know, that you didn't merge something wrong. Um, so we, we, we've got a lot of mileage out of the feature flags so far. Um, you can, that, you can update the application itself, the little Python app. There's only a couple hundred lines of code. There's a lot of stuff in here, but it's mostly data-driven. Um, all this stuff is, is driven off of a list of, um, yeah, just a, a list. I, think it's, I don't know if it's in Yaml or in JSON, I can't remember, but uh, there's just a list of applications and things, and you basically tell if it's a service or a Rails application, and it knows how to treat it appropriately. Uh, and then when, so like this morning I deployed local, uh, on here, and um, while well, I was here actually, and everything that Chef outputted was spit into here. So I can actually come in here and um, look at the Chef output. You know, if there's a problem, I can, I can see it. Um, and mostly I just want to see that I got exit code, you know, status code zero, and it happened successfully. You can see that, especially on the internet in this room, it took quite a while. Um, so it's not something you, this was a to deploy the entire application stack, but um, it. Yeah, it's not something you want to do multiple times a day if you can help it. And then, getting close to running out of time, I actually do want to show, is this readable? Mm -hmm. oh. All right. 
I usually switch to white when I can send hit on this one. But I just want to show the actual. Oh, this is a line because it's crappy here. I just want to actually show the Maker file because um, most of what I was just showing there is our sort of little automation stuff on top of Maker to make things easier and to work with our particular application stack. But the actual Maker file itself is pretty small. So um, we saw before we're just um, the, you know same stuff at the top, and then um, there's a couple things in here for people who are testing out new features and, uh, that we might be rolling out in, as part of our, our App Starter application. So just some environment var variable stuff. Uh, how many? How much memory? Right, six gigs. We can um, override that with an environment variable if we want. Um, it's just setting up a host name and uh, some the box we're using. Uh, so that Mega Manager Base Two is what we built with Packer. So we download that once and it makes Chef run significantly faster. Um, that's the URL for where that box is stored at Amazon. Um, here we're actually configuring the, the virtual machine and then configuring some network stuff. We actually mount the Maven directory into the Vagrant instance itself because then when, uh, if I run the build locally and I install everything into Maven, then I can actually go into Vagrant Manager and deploy what I just built. So it doesn't have to be built from uh, Jenkins, it can be built locally and then deployed into Vagrant Manager, which is a neat feature. Uh, but again, so, I mean, it's, we're not doing a whole lot of stuff to set all this up. Um, and we started out with even, even less than this. And then at the very end, we're just we're going to mount our provisioning directory, which has all of our chef stuff. And then here's where we're going to actually call out to our startup script. And that is um, basically the same as what we would do in, in production. And that's it. So that means, I don't remember how that is, maybe 150 or so. Um, I mean, all the rest of the magic happens in Chef, and then the tiny sort of app manager app. And we've actually we've considered open sourcing it, but right now it's not quite easy to configure it for just anyone. It's tied fairly specifically how we do stuff with feature flags and things like that, but um, it's, it's certainly an option for us at some point. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so I asked questions. Is the feature flags out of your uh, customization, or is that out of the box? That's just our customization. We just wrote a little jar that, um, and it has some groovy closures for responding to the feature flag turned on and off. And we have, um, you actually have to, like, if we add a new feature flag, someone actually has to go in and add a line to, I don't remember if it's a configuration file or the web app itself. It just says what the name of it is, and then it sets that value in Redis. And then the application responds to the uh, changing values in Redis. It's pretty similar. There's a Grails uh, feature flag plugin, and it works pretty similar to how that one works. You were saying for, to run that whole staff at six gigs yeah. of RAM. Is that something that if you had that in Docker, you expect it would be significantly less? No, because most of it is the applications themselves. Um, yeah, Grails apps are memory intensive. So, I mean, most of that, I mean, actually, I would say a third of it is our sort of legacy monolithic app. I think we give it two gigs or so. Um, I can't remember. Three gigs. I think it's three. Yeah, so half of it is a single <laughs> application running in there. The drop of their services, I think, run in like 256 or maybe even less. You can definitely run them in 64. Um, so, we, we at one point we were, over, we were at eight gigs. Uh, so, we have trimmed it down a bit. Um, but until we totally get rid of our monolithic legacy app, it's going to be hard for us to trim it down much. And then you said that, um, or I maybe just said, uh, do you run those, run those paper machines in production? No. Okay. So once we go to production, we'll just execute um, Chef against a set of EMIs running in EC2. So, um, or EMIs running in EC2. So, is mostly the same, but it's hard to get it to be completely identical. But the, the big thing is, is that the process for 
building the configuration, because Chef builds configuration files for each environment, and that process is the same within um, Vagrant that it is within Amazon, and so most of the time when we have any problems, it's like someone forgot to add a new, you know, a new configuration option to the production config file or something like that. Um, and so now when we see a chain go in, it's like, hey, we can actually like in the pull request process, be like, you need to make sure you make that change to production as well. And then when we run when we run Chef, you can be reasonably confident that if it run work in Vagrant, it will work in uh, production. 94% now. Other questions? I think it's the last time.